the nature of sanctification and gospel holiness explained. In the regeneration or conversion of God's elect, the nature and manner in which we have before described consists the second part of the work of the Holy Spirit in order to the completing and perfecting of the new creation. As in the former, he prepared a natural body for the Son of God in which he was to obey and suffer according to his will. So by this latter, he prepares them a mystical body or members spiritually living by uniting them to him who is their head and their life. Colossians 3 verse 4 For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12. Nor does he leave this work in that beginning of it in which we have treated, but to him also it belongs to continue it, to preserve it, and to carry it on to perfection, and this he does in our sanctification, whose nature and effects we are in the next place to inquire into. The Apostle in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, having closely compiled a great number of weighty particular evangelical duties and annexed a number of motives and enforcements to them, Closes all of his holy prescriptions with a fervent prayer for them, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and let your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or, as I'd rather read the words, And God himself, even the God of peace, sanctify you throughout, that your whole spirit and soul and body may be preserved blameless. The reason of this is because all the graces and duties which he had enjoined them did belong to their sanctification, which, though their own duty, was not absolutely in their own power, but was a work of God in them and upon them, therefore that they might be able to this end and might actually comply with his commands, he prays that God would thus sanctify them throughout, that this shall be accomplished in them and for them, and gives them assurance from the faithfulness and consequently power and unchangeableness, which are included in this, of him who had undertaken to effect it. Verse 24. Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. Now, whereas this assurance did not arise nor was taken from anything that was peculiar to them, but merely from the consideration of the faithfulness of God himself. It is equal with respect to all that are effectually called. They shall all infallibly be sanctified throughout and preserved blameless to the coming of Jesus Christ. This, therefore, being the great privilege of believers and their eternal safety absolutely depending upon it, it requires our utmost diligence to search into the nature and necessity of it, which may be done from this and the like places of Scripture. And in this place, number one, the author of our sanctification, who only is so, is asserted to be God. He is the eternal spring and only fountain of all holiness. There is nothing of it in any creature but what is directly and immediately from him. There was not in our first creation. He made us in his own image, and to suppose that we can now sanctify or make ourselves holy is proudly to renounce and cast off our principal dependence on him. We may as wisely and rationally contend that we have not our being and our life from God as that we have not our holiness from him, when we have any. To this end are the proud opinions of educing a holiness out of the principles of a nature to be reduced. I know all men will pretend that holiness is from God. It wasn't even denied by Pelagius himself. But many with him would have it to be from God in a way of nature and not in a way of special grace. It is the latter way which we plead for, and what is from ourselves or reduced by any means out of our natural abilities is not of God in that way. For God is the author of grace, and the best of corrupted nature are opposed, as we shall see further afterward. Number two, and therefore is he that is the author of our sanctification so emphatically here expressed, even God himself. If he does it not, no one else can do it. 
It is no other wise to be wrought nor effected. There is no other way in which it may be brought about, nor does it fall under the power or efficacy of any means, absolutely whatever, but it must be wrought by God himself. He does it of himself, from his own grace, by himself, or in his own power, for himself, for his own glory. And number three, in that, under this special consideration, as he is the God of peace. This title is ascribed to God only by our apostle and by him frequently. Romans 15, verse 33. Romans 16, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Philippians 4, verse 9. And Hebrews 13, verse 20. Were it to our present purpose to discourse concerning the general nature of peace, I might show how it is comprehensive of all order, rest, and blessedness, and all that is in them. On this account, the enclosure of it in this title to God, as its only possessor and author, belongs to the glory of a sovereign diadem. Everything that is contrary to it is evil, and of the evil one. Yea, all that is evil is so, because of its contrariety to peace. Well, therefore, may God be styled the God of peace. But the things I may not here stay to explain, although the words are so comprehensive and expressive of the whole work of sanctification, and that holiness which is the effect of it, is that I shall choose to found my whole discourse concerning the subject on them. That which offers itself to our present design from this expression is a peculiar respect to the work of our sanctification which lies in the special property of God. Therefore, is he said to sanctify us, is a God of peace. First, because it is a fruit and effect of that peace with himself which he has made and prepared for us by Jesus Christ. For he was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, destroying the enmity which entered by sin, and laying the foundation of eternal peace. From hence it is that he will sanctify us or make us holy without a respect to, he would no more do so than he will sanctify again the angels that have sinned, for whom there is no peace made, nor atonement. Secondly, God, by the sanctification of our natures and persons, preserves that peace with himself in its exercise, which he made and procured by the mediation of Christ, without which it could not be kept or continued. For in the duties and fruits of it consist all those actings towards God which a state of reconciliation, peace, and friendship require. It is holiness that keeps up a sense of peace with God, and prevents those spiritual breaches which the remainders of our enmity would occasion. Hence God is the author of our peace, is the author of our holiness. God, even God himself, the God of peace sanctifies us. How this is done immediately by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love and peace, and in what the nature of this work consists are the things which must afterwards be more fully declared. And he is here said to sanctify us, that is, universally and completely carrying on the work until it comes to perfection. For two things are intended in that expression. First, that our whole nature is the subject of this work, and not any one faculty or part of it. Second, that is, the work itself is sincere and universal, communicating all parts of real holiness to our whole nature, so it is carried on to completeness and perfection. Both these and the ensuing words the Apostle expresses is the end and design of his prayer for them, and the effect of the work of grace which he prayed for. For first, the subject of this sanctification he makes to be our whole natures, which he distributes to our entire spirits, souls, and bodies. And second, the end of the whole is the preservation of his blameless and the peace of God to the coming of Christ, which will both of them be immediately more fully spoken to. Therefore, sanctification is here described is the immediate work of God by His Spirit on our whole nature, proceeding from the peace made for us by Jesus Christ, in which, being changed into His likeness, we are kept entirely in peace with God, and are preserved unblameable or in a state of gracious acceptance with Him, according to the terms of the covenant, to the end. The nature of this work and its effect 
which is our holiness, with the necessity of them both, we must on many accounts with our utmost diligence inquire and search and to this both the importance of the truth itself and the opposition that is made to it render necessary. Besides, whereas we are in the declaration of the special operations of the Holy Spirit, although he be not so denominated originally from this peculiar work, as though he should be called holy merely because he is the author of holiness and all that are made partakers of it. Yet there is a general consent, in words at least, among all who are called Christians, that this is his immediate and proper work, or that he is the only sanctifier of all them that believe. And this I shall take as yet for granted. Although some among us, who not only pretend high to the preaching of holiness, whatever be their practice, but reproach others as weakening the necessity of it, talk at such a rate as if in the holiness which they plead for, he had nothing to do in a peculiar manner, for it is no news to f meet with quaint and gilded discourses about holiness intermixed with scoffing reflections on the work of the Holy Spirit in it. This work, therefore, of his, we are in a special manner to attend to, unless we be found among the number of such as those who own themselves, and teach their children that the Holy Ghost sanctifies all the elect of God, and yet not only despise the work of holiness and themselves, but deride those who plead an interest in it as an effect of the sanctification of the Spirit. For such fruits of secret atheism does the world abound with. But our principal duty in this world is to know aright what it is to be holy, and so to be indeed. One thing we must premise to clear our ensuing discourse from ambiguity and that is that there is mention in the scripture of a twofold sanctification and consequently of a twofold holiness. The first is common to persons and things consisting in a peculiar dedication, consecration, or separation of them to the service of God by his own appointment in which they become holy. Thus the priests and Levites of old, the ark, the altar, the tabernacle, and the temple were sanctified and made holy. And indeed, in all holiness whatever, there is a peculiar dedication and separation to God. But in the sense mentioned, this is solitary and alone. No more belonged to it but this sacred separation, nor was there any other effect of this sanctification. But secondly, there is another kind of sanctification and holiness in which this separation to God is not the first thing done or intended, but a consequent and effect of it. This is real and internal by the communicating of a principle of holiness to our natures, attended with its exercise and acts and duties of holy obedience to God. This is that which, in the first place, we inquire after, and how far believers are in this and by this peculiarly separated and dedicated to God shall be afterward declared. And to what we have to deliver concerning it, we shall make way by the ensuing observations. 1. This whole matter of sanctification and holiness is peculiarly joined with and limited to the doctrine, truth, and grace of the gospel. For holiness is nothing but the implanting, writing, and realizing of the gospel in our souls. And so it is termed Ephesians 4. 24. The holiness of truth, which the truth of the gospel generates, and which consists in the conformity thereto. And the gospel itself is said, in Titus 1, 1, the truth which is according to godliness, which declares the godliness and holiness which God requires. The prayer also of our Savior for our sanctification is conformed to this end in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them in or by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And he sanctified himself for us to be a sacrifice, so we might be sanctified in the truth. This alone is that truth which makes us free, John 8, verse 32, that is, from sin and the law, to righteousness and holiness. It belongs neither to nature nor the law, so as to proceed from them or to be effected by them. Nature is wholly corrupted and contrary to it. The law indeed for certain ends was given by Moses, but all grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. 
There neither is, nor ever was in the world, nor ever shall be the least dream of holiness, but what flowing from Jesus Christ is communicated by the Spirit, according to the truth and the promise of the gospel. There may be something like it, as to its outward acts and effects, at least some of them, something that may wear its library in the world, that is but the fruit of men's own endeavors in compliance with their convictions. But holiness it isn't nor of the same kind or nature with it. In this, men are very apt to deceive themselves with. It is a design of corrupted reason to debase all the glorious mysteries of the gospel and all the concerns of them. There is nothing in the whole mystery of godliness from the highest crown of it, which is the person of Christ, God manifested in the flesh to the lowest and nearest effect of this grace, but it labors to deprave, dishonor, and debase. The Lord Christ it would have in his whole person to be but a mere man, and his obedience and suffering to be but an example to us, and his doctrine to be confined to the capacity and comprehension of carnal reason, and a holiness which he communicates by the sanctification of a spirit to be but that moral virtue which is common among men as the fruit of their own endeavors. In this, some will acknowledge that men are guided and directed to a great advantage by the doctrine of the gospel, and to this end excited by motions of the Holy Spirit himself, put forth in the dispensation of that truth, but anything else in it more excellent more mysterious, they will not allow. But these low and carnal imaginations are exceedingly unworthy of the grace of Christ, the glory of the gospel, the mystery of the recovery of our nature, and the healing of the wound that received by the entrance of sin, with the whole design of God and a restoration to a state of communion with himself. Moral virtue is, indeed, the best thing amongst men that is of them. It far exceeds in worth, use, and sanctification all that the honors, powers, profits, and pleasures of the world can extend to. And it is admirable to consider what instructions are given concerning it, what expressions are made of its excellency, what encomiums of its use and beauty by learned contemplative men among the heathen, the wisest of whom acknowledged that there was yet something in it which they could only admire, but they couldn't comprehend. And very eminent instances of the practice of it were given in the lives and conversations of some of them, and as the examples of their righteousness, moderation, temperance, equanimity in all conditions, rise up at present to the shame and reproach of many that are called Christians. So they will be called over at the last day as an aggravation of their condemnation. But to suppose that this moral virtue, whatever it be really in its own nature, or however advanced in the imaginations of men, is that holiness of truth which believers receive by the Spirit of Christ, is to debase it, to overthrow it, and to drive the souls of men from seeking an interest in it. And hence it is that some pretending highly of friendship and respect to it, yet hate, despise, and reproach what is really so, pleasing themselves with the empty name or withered carcass of virtue, every way inferior, is interpreted in their practice to the righteousness of heathen. And this, in the first place, should stir up our diligence and in our inquiries after its true and real nature, that we don't deceive ourselves with the false appearance of it, and that to our ruin. Number two, it is our duty to inquire into the nature of evangelical holiness as it is a fruit or effect in us of the spirit of sanctification because it is abstruse and mysterious and be it spoken with the good leave of some or whether they will or not, undiscernible to the eye of carnal reason. We may say of it in some sense as Job of wisdom. Whence comes wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? Sin it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of heaven. Destruction and death, say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understands the way of it, and he knows the place of it. And a man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Chapter 28, verses 20 to 23 and verse 28. 
This is that wisdom whose ways, residence, and paths are so hidden from the natural reason and understandings of men. No man, I say, by his mere sight and conduct, can no one understand the right to true nature of evangelical holiness. And it is, therefore, no wonder if the doctrine of it be despised by many as an enthusiastical fancy. It is of the things of the Spirit of God, yea, it is the principal effect of all of his operations in us and towards us. And these things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. It is by him alone that we are enabled to know the things that are freely given to us of God, verse 12. And this is, if ever we receive anything of him in this world, or shall do so to eternity, I is not seen, or you are heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. The comprehension of these things is not the work of any of our natural faculties, but God reveals them to us by his Spirit, verses 9 and 10. So it often falls out, as it did in the Jews and Pharisees of old, that those who are most zealous and industrious for, and after, a legal righteousness, walking in a strict attendance to duties proportionable to the light and convictions that they have, pretending to be it, and bearing some resemblance of it, are the most fierce and implacable enemies of true evangelical holiness. They know it not, and therefore, they hate it. They have embraced something else in its place instead, and therefore despise and persecute it as it befalls them who embrace error for truth in any kind. And number three, believers themselves are oftentimes much unacquainted with it, either as to their apprehension of its true nature, causes, and effects, or at least as to their own interests and concern in it. As we know not of ourselves the things that are wrought in us of the Spirit of God, so we seldom attend as we ought to his instructing of us in them. It may seem strange indeed that, whereas all believers are sanctified and made holy, they should not understand or apprehend what is wrought in them and for them and what abides with them. But alas, how little do we know of ourselves, of what we are, and whence are our powers and faculties, even in things natural? Do we know how the members of the body are fashioned in the womb? We are apt to be seeking after and giving reasons for all things, and to describe the progress of the production of our natures from first to last, so as if not to satisfy ourselves, yet to please and amuse others. For vain man would be wise, though he is born like the wild ass's colt. The best issues of our consideration in this is that of the psalmist, you, O Lord, have possessed my reins. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance wasn't hid from you. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in your book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In quote, Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. By a diligent consideration of these things, we may obtain a firm foundation to stand on, and a holy admiration of the infinite wisdom and goodness of that sovereign architect, who has raised this fabric to his own glory. And what we further attempt is vanity and curiosity. How little do we know of these souls of ours? And all that we do so is by their powers and operations, which are consequential to their being. Now these things are our own naturally. They dwell and abide with us. They are we, and we are they, and nothing else. Yet it is no easy thing for us to have a reflex and intimate acquaintance with them. And isn't it strange if we should be much in the dark to this new nature, this new creature, which comes from above, from God in heaven, in which our natural reason has no acquaintance? It is new. It is wonderful. It is a supernatural work, and is known only by supernatural revelation. Besides, there are other things which pretend to be this gospel holiness and are not in which unspeakable multitudes are deluded and deceived, with some any reformation of life and abstinence from flagitious sins, 
with the performance of the common duties of religion is all which they suppose is required to this head of their duty. Others contend with violence to substitute moral virtues by which they do not know themselves and what they intend in the room of it. And there is a work of the law which, in the fruits of it, internal and external, in the works of righteousness and duties, is hardly and not but by spiritual light and measures to be distinguished from it. This also adds to the difficulty of understanding it aright, and we must diligently inquire into it. Number four. We must also consider that holiness is not confined to this life, but passes over into eternity and glory. Death has no power over it to destroy or divest us of it. For its acts indeed are transient, but its fruits abide forever in their reward. They who die in the Lord rest from their labors, and their works follow them. Revelation 14, verse 13. God is not unrighteous to forget their labor of love. Hebrews 6, verse 10. There is not any effect or fruit of holiness, not the least. Not the giving of a cup of cold water to a disciple of Christ in the name of a disciple, but it shall be had in everlasting remembrance and abide forever in its eternal reward. Nothing shall be lost, but all the fragments of it shall be gathered up and kept safe forever. Everything else, how specious soever it be in this world, shall be burnt up and consumed as hay and stubble, when the least, the meanest, the most secret fruit of holiness shall be gathered as gold and silver, durable substance, into God's treasury, and become a part of the riches of the inheritance of the saints in glory. Let no soul fear the loss of any labor in any of the duties of holiness and the most secret contest against sin, for inward purity, for outward fruitfulness, in the mortification of sin, resisting of temptations, improvement of grace, in patience, moderation, self-denial, and contentment. All that you do know and what you do not know shall be revived, called over, and abide eternally in your reward. Our Father, who now sees in secret, will one day reward openly, and the more we abound in thee things, the more will God be glorified in the recompense of reward. But this is not all, nor that which I intend. Number two, it abides forever and passes over into glory in its principle or nature, the love of which we now adhere to God, and by which we act the obedience of faith towards the saints, fails not. It ends not when glory comes on, but is a part of it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. It is true, some gifts shall be done away, it's useless in a state of perfection and glory, as the apostle there discourses. And some graces shall cease, as to some special acts and peculiar exercises, faith and hope, so far as they respect things unseen and future. But all those graces in which holiness is constituted and in which it consists, for the substance of them, as they contain the image of God, as by them we are united and adhere to God and Christ, shall in their present nature, improved into perfection, abide forever. In our knowledge of them, therefore, have we our principal insight into our eternal condition and glory, and this is as a firm foundation of consolation. So a part of our chiefest joy in this world, it is not a matter of unspeakable joy and refreshment that these poor bodies we carry about us after we have been made a prey to death, dust, worms, and corruption, shall be raised and restored to life and immortality freed from pain, sickness, weakness, weariness, invested with those qualities in conformity to Christ's glorious body, which yet we do not understand. It is so also that these souls which now animate and rule in us shall be delivered from all their darkness, ignorance, vanity, instability, and alienation from things spiritual and heavenly. But this is not all. These poor low graces which now live and act, and are acting in us, shall be continued, preserved, purified, and perfected, but in their nature, be the same as now they are, as our souls and bodies shall be. That love in which we now adhere to God is our chiefest good. That faith in which we are united to Christ, 
our everlasting head, that delight in any of the ways or ordinances of God in which he is enjoyed, according as he has promised his presence in them, that loving good will which we have for all those in whom is the Spirit, and on whom is the image of Christ, with the entire principle of spiritual life and holiness, which is now begun in any of us, shall be all purified, enhanced, perfected, and passed into glory, that very holiness which we here attain, those inclinations and dispositions, those frames of mind, those powers and abilities and obedience and adherence to God, which here contend with the weight of their own weakness and imperfection, and with the opposition that is continually made against them by the body of death, that is utterly to be abolished, shall be gloriously perfected into immutable habits, unchangeably acting our souls in the enjoyment of God, And this also manifests how much concern it is to us to be acquainted with the doctrine of it, and of how much more to be really interested in it. Yea, number five, there is spiritual and heavenly glory in it in this world. From this is a church, the king's daughter, said to be all glorious within. Her inward adorning with the graces of the Spirit, making her beautiful in holiness, is called glory, and is so. Psalm 45, verse 13. So also the progress and increase of believers in this is called by our apostle their being changed from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. From one degree of glorious grace to another, and this, next to the comeliness of the righteousness of Christ, put upon us by the free grace of God, is our only beauty in his sight. So it is such as hath a real spiritual glory in it, it is the first fruits of heaven, and as the apostle argues concerning the Jews, that if the first fruits were holy, then is the whole lump holy. So may we, on the other side, if the whole weight, as he calls it, and fullness of our future enjoyment be glory, then are the first fruits in their measure so also. There is in this holiness, as we shall see further afterwards, a ray of eternal light, a principle of eternal life and the entire nature of that love in which we shall eternally adhere to God. The divine nature, the new immortal creature, the life of God, the life of Christ, are all comprised in it. It represents to God the glory of his own image renewed in us, and to the Lord Christ the fruits of his spirit and effect of his mediation in which he sees of the travail of his soul and is satisfied. There is, therefore, nothing more to be abhorred than those carnal, low, and unworthy thoughts which some men vent of this glorious work of the Holy Spirit, who would have it wholly to consist in a legal righteousness or moral virtue. Number six, this is that which God indispensably requires of us. The full prosecution of this consideration we must put off to our arguments for the necessity of it, which will ensue in their proper place. But for the present I shall show that not only God requires holiness indispensably in all believers, but also that this is all which he requires of them or expects from them, for it comprises the whole duty of man. And this surely renders it needful for us both to know what it is and diligently to apply ourselves to the obtaining an assured participation of it. For what servant who has any sense of his relation and duty, if he is satisfied that his master requires but one thing of him, will not endeavor an acquaintance with it in the performance of it. Some indeed say that their holiness, such as it is, is the chief or only design of the gospel. If they mean by this that it is the first principal design of God in and by the gospel, and that not only as to the preceptive part of it, but also to its doctrinal and promissory parts, whence it is principally and emphatically denominated, it is a fond imagination. God's great and first design in and by the gospel, is eternally to glorify himself, his wisdom, goodness, love, grace, righteousness, and holiness by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 5, and 6. And in order to this, his great and supreme end, he has designed the gospel, and designs by the gospel, which gives the gospel its design, first, to reveal that love and grace of his to lost sinners, 
with the way of its communication through the mediation of his Son incarnate, is the only means in which he will be glorified, and by this that they may be saved. Acts 26, 18. And secondly, to prevail with men, and then by the dispensation of its truth and encouragement of its promises, to renounce their sins and all other expectations of relief or satisfaction, and to betake themselves by faith to that way of life and salvation which is therein declared to them. Second Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 21. Colossians 1, verses 25 to 28. Thirdly, to be the means and instrument of conveying over to them and giving them a title to and a right in that grace and mercy, that life and righteousness which is revealed and tendered to them by it. Mark 16, verse 16. Fourthly, to be the way and means of communicating the Spirit of Christ with grace and strength to the elect, enabling them to believe and receive the atonement. Galatians 3, 2. Fifthly, hereby to give them union with Christ, as their spiritual and mystical head, as also to fix their hearts and souls into their choicest actings and their faith, trust, confidence, and love, immediately on the Son of God as incarnate, and their mediator, John 14, 1. Therefore, the first and principal end of the gospel towards us is to invite and encourage lost sinners to the faith and approval of the way of grace life and salvation by Jesus Christ. Without a compliance wherewith in the first place, the gospel has no more to do with sinners but leaves them to justice, the law, and themselves. But now upon a supposition of these things, and of our giving glory to God by faith in them, the hold that God requires of us in the gospel and a way of duty is that we should be holy and abide in the use of those means in which holiness may be attained and improved in us. For if he require any other thing of us, it must be on one of these four accounts. One, to make atonement for our sins, or two, to be our righteousness before him, or three, to merit life and salvation by, or four, to supererogate in the behalf of others. No other end can be thought of, besides what are the true ends of holiness in which God should require anything of us. And all the false religion that is in the world leans on a supposition that God requires somewhat of us with respect to these sins. But he requires nothing of us which we had all the reason in the world to expect that he would, to make atonement or satisfaction for our sins that might compensate the injuries we have done him by our apostasy and rebellion. For, whereas we had multiplied sins against him, lived in an enmity and opposition to him, and had contracted insupportable and immeasurable depths upon our souls, terms of peace being now proposed, who could think but that the first thing required of us would be that we should make some kind of satisfaction to divine justice for all our enormous and heinous provocations? Yea, who is there that indeed does naturally think otherwise? So he apprehended who was contriving away in his own mind how he might come to an agreement with God, Micah 6, 6 and 7, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This or something of this nature seems to be but a very reasonable inquiry for a guilty, self-condemned sinner, when first he entertained thoughts of an agreement with the holy sin of ending God. And this was the foundation of that cruel and expensive superstition that the world was in bondage to for so many ages. Mankind generally thought that the principal thing which was required of them in religion was to atone and pacify the wrath of the divine power, and to make a compensation for what had been done against him. Hence were their sacrifices of hecticombs, of beasts, of mankind, of their children, and of themselves. And the same principle is still deeply rooted in the minds of convinced or awakened sinners, and many an abbey, monastery, college, and almshouse has it founded. For in the fruits of this superstition, the priests which set it on work always shared deeply 
but quite otherwise. In the gospel there is declared and tendered to sinners an absolute free pardon of all of their sins without any satisfaction or compensation made or made on their part, that is, by themselves, namely on the account of the atonement made for them by Jesus Christ. And all attempts or endeavors after works or duties of obedience in any respect satisfactory to God for sin or meritorious of pardon subvert and overthrow the whole gospel. See Second Corinthians five eighteen to twenty one. Therefore, in answer to the inquiry before mentioned, the reply in the prophet is that God looks for none of these things, and that all such contrivances were wholly vain. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8, which last expression comprises the whole of our covenant obedience, Genesis 17, 1, as the two former are eminent instances of it in particular. But number two, he requires nothing of us in a way of righteousness for our justification for the future. That this also he would have done, we might have justly expected, for a righteousness we must have, or we cannot be accepted with him. And here also many are at a loss, and resolve that it is a thing fond and inconvenient to think of peace with God without some righteousness of their own, on the account in which they may be justified before him, and rather than they will forego that apprehension, they will let go all other thoughts of peace and acceptance. Being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they go about to establish their own righteousness and do not submit themselves to the righteousness of God, nor will they acquiesce in it. The Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Romans 10.4 But so it is that God requires not this of us in the gospel, for we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, 24. And we do therefore conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, verse 28. So chapters 8, verses 3 and 4. Neither is there any mention in the whole gospel of God's requiring a righteousness in us upon the account in which we should be justified before him, or in a sight. For the justification by works mentioned in the book of James consists in the evidencing and declaration of our faith by them. Number three, God requires not anything of us in which we should purchase or merit for ourselves life and salvation. For by grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. God saves us neither by nor for the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, Titus 3, 5. So that although on the one side the wages of sin is death, there being a proportion and justice between sin and punishment, yet there is none between our obedience and our salvation, and therefore eternal life is the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, verse 23. God therefore requires nothing at our hands under this notion or consideration, nor is it possible that in our condition any such thing should be required of us. For whatever we can do is due beforehand on other accounts, and so can have no prospect to merit what is to come. Who can merit? By doing his duty. Our Savior does so plainly prove the contrary as none can further doubt of it than of his truth and authority. Luke 17.10 Nor can we do anything that is acceptable to him but what is wrought in us by his grace. And this overthrows the whole nature of merit, which requires that that be every way our own in which we would deserve someone else at the hands of another, and not his more than ours. Neither is there any proportion between our duties and the reward of the internal enjoyment of God, for besides that they are all weak and perfect and tainted with sin, so that none of them is able to make good its own station for any end or purpose in the strictness of divine justice. They altogether come infinitely short of the desert of an eternal reward by any rule of divine justice. And if any say that this merit of our works depends not on nor is measured by strict justice, but wholly by the gracious condescension of God who has appointed and promised so to reward them, I answer in the first place 
that this perfectly overthrows the whole nature of merit. For the nature of merit consists entirely and absolutely in this, that to him that works is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Romans 4.4 4. And these two are contrary and inconsistent. For what is by grace is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, and what is of works is no more of grace, otherwise work is no more work. Chapter 11.6 and those who go about to found a merit of ours and the grace of God endeavor to unite and reconcile those things which God has everlastingly separated and opposed. And I say, secondly, that although God does freely, graciously, and bountifully reward our duties of obedience, and upon the account of his covenant and promise he is said to be, and he is righteous in his so doing, yet... He everywhere declares that what he so does is an act of mere grace in himself. It has no respect to anything, but only the interposition and mediation of Jesus Christ. In this sense, God in the gospel requires of us nothing at all.